as we've been mentioning the last couple services, we are going to be continuing, actually concluding in Genesis 19 tonight. And if you've been reading ahead, as we, we really do encourage you to do, if you have been looking at where we're going to be this evening, you might, along with uh, many others, have read this evening's text, Genesis 19, beginning in verse 30 down to verse 38, and, and had the question of, why is this in here? What do we do with this? Uh, there is quite a lot of speculation and, and, and wonder that goes into a text like this when you come into it, that it's sort of a question of, where do we go? Uh, wholeheartedly, we would embrace the, the, the doctrine that all Scripture is profitable that we find in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We would affirm that, but then we come to a text like we're going to be in this evening, and we do have to wonder a little bit of, what do I do with this? As I was preparing for tonight's sermon, I came across the words of one commentator as he was working through a particularly graphic text of Scripture. There this author wrote, If the sermons preached in our churches were movies, what ratings would the distributors give them? In many churches, every sermon would rate a G for general audiences. He goes on to say, Sometimes only an R-rated sermon does justice to the outrage of sin. Now, Lord willing, tonight's sermon won't be R-rated, but we are going to be dealing with some adult themes. Because as this commentator concludes, sin is ugly, offensive, and depraved. And beloved, we need to know that. We need to see the ugliness and the horror and the awful effects that sin takes on people. How it twists their story into tragedy. Into tragedy. You know, I'm preparing tonight's sermon. I was really the best word that I could come up with to describe our central character from the text. Tragedy, according to one dictionary definition, says it's a literary work in which the main character is brought to ruin or suffers sorrow, or it could be defined as a disastrous event. That perfectly describes the scene that will hold our focus for this evening. As I waded into this text, I couldn't help but come to the conclusion over and over again, poor Lot. Poor Lot. We... Last time in Genesis 19 saw the destruction of Lot's home, his family, those who would be his, his countrymen. And now as we come to the conclusion of Lot's story, we see the abject tragedy that his story has become. But Lot chose this. That's the astonishing thing. Lot chose exactly what we'll see tonight. And truthfully, that's my great burden for this evening, is that as I stand here this evening, we would hear this warning together. That we would hear the tragedy of Lot and know that it doesn't have to be this way. That's the big idea for this evening. It doesn't have to be this way. Now that might seem like a strange thing for our big idea. It might, might seem incomplete, but I hope as we walk through the tragedy of Lot this evening, you'll see exactly what I mean. Because i got to tell you, Beloved, this, this evening as I stand under this text, I, I stand and I survey Lot's trajectory over the whole of Scripture. And I'm terrified that there would be some Lot's among us this evening. That there would be some who would think it, it, it's going to turn out okay. I, I, can, I can pitch towards Sodom or, or live among its denizens and, and somehow remain unbesmirched by its filth. Well, but I'm here tonight to cry out like wisdom in the streets and tell you it, it ain't going to work. It, it's going to end in misery. It's going to end in destruction. And maybe not for you. Maybe not for your soul, but, but you don't get to write the end of the story for those whom your life touches. We don't have the foresight to see how many generational ripples compromise in sin will go. What we do have is the sure word of God to warn us that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. This evening through this message, many of you are going to stand at a crossroad. You'll, you'll I, I hope, be brought to do an examination, an inspection of your life. How, home, how at home in Sodom streets are you? Now, are you willing and wanting to have the world in one hand and endure the misery of living among evil companions. Maybe knowing you're a believer, but disregarding the disastrous effects it will take on those that you love. 
Are you willing to get serious and fight off evil today so that you don't end up in the torments of Lot? This evening we're going to walk through this section of Scripture. We're going to walk through the tragedy of Lot really in three parts. Where we're going to look at the event. We're going to look at the effects. And and to borrow from a a, a literature term, the exode. the, The conclusion. The events, the effects, and the exode. The events begin here in Genesis 19, 30 through 38. And we're going to really read through this text, or at least the majority of it, before we begin to kind of pick it apart. And we consider the events in Lot's life. Genesis 19, verse 30 begins, Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains. And his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. And he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old. There's not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine. Let us lie with him that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. On the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. The younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Really, just beginning in verse 30, we're, we're going to pick apart what's taking place in this text. This is the conclusion of Lot's particular story. And it begins with him leaving the place he had been delivered to. One commentator here said Lot needed to be pulled out of Sodom by the scruff of his neck. He needed no assistance, however, in getting out of Zoar. There's a lot of speculation, and the scripture isn't specific to tell us as to exactly what he was afraid of, but it says very clearly in verse 30 that he was afraid to stay in Zoar. Now it could be, and this is personally what I believe, it could be that he really didn't trust that the Lord was going to spare that town also. Zoar had been on the list of condemned cities, cities of the valley that were there that were going to be destroyed just a few verses before. But as Lot is being dragged from Sodom with his family, he he requests of the angel, no, 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 I can't go to those mountains. Can't, Can't I just go to this little town over here? And that town is spared because of Lot's presence. But here we don't even know how long after Lot seems to second guess that and says, no, 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 I I am going to go to the mountains. I think that Lot's view of God was so twisted in this whole scenario that he didn't really know if he could believe that God would actually still save Zoar because he was there. And really, can you blame him? From miles and miles away, Abram is able to see, Abraham now at this point is able to see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah rising like the smoke of a furnace. And here, just next door, is Lot and his daughters. The other possibility that many believe is that Lot was afraid of the people of Zoar. You're the only survivor. You're the only one that knew to get out. Maybe through some fear of what would happen at their hands, Lot, rather than being led by faith, is led by fear. He stayed in a cave. He and whose two daughters. That fear is even echoed in the girl's attitude in the following verses where it says, there's not a man on earth. There's there's no one else. Some have speculated that maybe they thought this is the end of all things. We're, We're going to be the remnant of humanity. That so total was the destruction of the region around them that they thought it's just us. This pragmatic mentality, this this fear it takes over. But what should frighten us a little bit more is how exactly they got there. Their ready at hand solution was perversity. Because through their upbringing they were already fluent in sexual perversion. One pastor said Lot, Lot's wife left her heart in Sodom. Sodom left its morality and his daughters and all in all covenant drifting brought covenant disaster. He goes on to say, I suppose there's nothing sinful in it itself about a Sodom address, but it's stupid. And what is stupid can sometimes become tragic. Because we remember, this didn't just begin this day. 
This didn't begin with these daughters of Lot saying, well, hey, I've concocted this plan. As I already mentioned, they're, they're fluent in this perversity, this immorality. And said so this began all the way back in chapter 13. When faced with a decision of what to do, Lot chooses what will be most beneficial to himself. Chapter 13, beginning in verse 10, it says that Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan that was well watered everywhere, like the garden of God. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan. Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Unless we think this was merely a just good strategic business decision on Lot's part. The very next verse records for us, Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. And Lot says, but it's okay. I'm, I'm just that way. I'm just heading in that direction. I, I'm sure I'll stay out. I, I'm sure it won't affect me. Lot chose a decision that in the moment, in worldly wisdom, it looked okay. Well, this is the best for the flocks, right? It's well watered. It's, it's verdant. It's beautiful. My, my flocks and herds will do well here. What's the harm in getting close to the wicked? It continues in chapter 14 with Lot now being so wrapped up in Sodom that he's living in Sodom is what chapter 14 verse 12 tells us. So much so that even as there's a little bit of physical judgment brought on the city of Sodom through warfare and destruction, Lot and his family are swept up in the midst of it. And if that wasn't warning enough, Lot now, by the time we come to the beginning of his story in chapter 19 verse 1, it says that Lot was sitting in the gates of Sodom where there aren't even ten righteous people found in the whole city. And even as those in the city would say, you, you, you're acting like one of our rulers. Perhaps Lot thought, hey, I, I can change this. Maybe he was part of the insider movement. He would infiltrate their society and change it from inside. What but John read for us already in 2 Peter chapter 2 tells us that he was oppressed. He was weighed down and burdened, afflicted by the torments of the wicked that he saw daily as he lived in Sodom. Almost parallels the warning trajectory of Psalm 1. Walking, standing, now finally found sitting. But even consider what happened with Lot in his physical deliverance. Pastor Philip hit on this just a few weeks ago. Just, just notice, if you remember from chapter 19, he appeals to the Sodomites as brothers. Verse 7 of chapter 19 well, really beginning in verse 6, Lot went out to them who, when the whole city turns out to commit acts of immorality, Lot went out, shut the door behind him and said, please, my brothers, don't do so wickedly. Then he seeks to compromise. He would deliver his own daughters to their violence. Verse 8, now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. He's ineffective in his warning witness. When the angels say, no, 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 we, we've got to go. Get everybody that is associated with you out of the city. Lot had become so entethered and, 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 and trapped in the society of Sodom that when he goes out to those who would be his sons-in-law, they thought he was joking around. Verse 14, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They couldn't take him seriously anymore. He had lived in safety among them for so long that even as he cried out for their deliverance, you can't be serious. He has to be urged to escape the judgment of the Lord. Verse 16 begins with that famous phrase, but he hesitated. He lingered. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, escape for your life. And then as we come to the end of this, this section as he's fleeing for his life, he, he disbelieves the extent of God's grace. No, my Lord, we won't make it as if it depends on him anyway. 
There's so much muddling and confusion and, and, and mixture in Lot's life. So one commentator put it, even after the destruction of Sodom, the mentality of Sodom remained. Another pastor pointed out, the one who offered his daughters for the sexual gratification of his wicked neighbors now becomes the objects of his daughter's incestuous relationship. This is where Lot's choices led him. This is where sin took Lot. And now that his daughters have executed their plan using sinful means of drunkenness to accomplish it, they've gotten what they've desired. Look with me at verse 37. Excuse me, verse 36. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. From this point on, the events of, of time are, are really compressed. It would have taken five to eight weeks for the certainty of their actions to be realized. Scripture doesn't tell us, but do you wonder, what was Lot's response? What was Lot's response to the realization? Do you know? Scripture is very clear that at least in the immediacy, he didn't. They got him so stupefied, drunk, that he didn't know when they came in and when they got up. Eventually, did they have to come clean and tell their father what they had done? Did he have to live under the shadow of wondering for the rest of his days? Did he wonder, well, I, I don't know how this happened, but the names of Moab and the name of Ammon Ben Ami. Their plays on words. They mean in various ways from the kinsmen or from my father. They could be explained away. They could have sort of double meaning. But were they a way that Lot's daughters mocked him for the rest of his days? This is the stigma that all their descendants would live under for the rest of their life. Verse 37 and verse 38. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. Verse 38. As for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Either way, if Lot knew or if he didn't, it's little wonder that when in Second Peter in the text that John just read for us, that uses the word torment to describe Lot's response to the wickedness of Sodom that followed him out of the city. It's the same word. That word of torments literally means to torture. And it's used to describe the agonies of the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. That was the misery of Lot. As I mentioned, the time span compresses even more. And with that explanation that this is the origin of the nations of Moab and the origin of the nation of Ammon, we get the bigger picture of why this story is here. To the original audience for whom Moses was recording this story, remember we've said is, is, is this is all being compiled, is this is all being taken down by Moses. There, there's a sense in which as the children of Israel are standing on the cusp of of the wilderness, getting ready to go into the promised land. Their history is being recorded in an inspired record for them to know where they stand and how they stand in relation to all the other nations around them. They hear the conclusion of Lot's story that began in chapter 12. Here's this young man who follows his uncle into the promised land. But now they hear the origin of Moab and Ammon, and this is going to direct how they think, how they categorically view these nations. When they hear that they're not wiping out Moab and Ammon, like the other nations, the Canaanites, they're going to go in and they've been told to put everyone to the sword from the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all these others. But not the Moabites, not the Ammonites. Now they know why. Because they're distantly, if twistedly, connected to these nations. For Lot and for his unnamed daughters, never once in scripture are they named. For Lot, this is the last we'll hear of him. 
He never resurfaces in the Old Testament except in passing references the father of the nations of Moab and Ammon. This takes us to the second section for this evening. This is the events, but let's look at the effects. The effects of Lot's foolish choice in chapter 13 doesn't just end in the shame and ignominy recorded in Genesis 19.38. It doesn't end there. Because throughout the rest of the Old Testament, Moab and Ammon will be antagonists to God's people. It, It sort of begins with lumping them in with the rest of the Canaanite nations in their practices. Immorality was rampant there. Even the sort that began these nations of Moab and Ammon would later become synonymous with their religious practices. You can hold your place here in Genesis. Turn with me. <clears throat> Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. We'll just look at a few verses here. In recording how the nation of Israel should conduct itself, it contrasts with how the nations of the land conduct themselves. Beginning in verse 1 of Leviticus 18, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you going to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments, keep my statutes, to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncovered nakedness. I am the Lord. And the rest of chapter 18 is this chronicle mainly of sexual immorality. Sexual sins that were running rampant in this land. The chapter concludes, verse 24. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land, land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it, so the land has spewed out its inhabitants. In other words, everybody that lives there practices these things. Don't be like them. Moab and Ammon are going to be connected to these specific practices, all these areas of sexual immorality in chapter 20 with the mention of their deity, Molech. But for a while, at least in the beginning of Israel's history, as they come into the land, as the Lord gives them victory in Joshua, they begin to take it over. <clears throat> at first, Moab and Ammon are treated with a sort of laissez-faire policy. It's, it's sort of, don't harass them. In fact, that's the specific command given in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Moses tells the nation of Israel, Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war. For I will not give you any of their land as a possession. Because I have given R to the sons of Lot as a possession. A few verses later, Deuteronomy 2.19, it says, When you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass or provoke them. Same reason, I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. But as Israel begins to take up residence, Moab and Ammon are continually growing antagonistic. In Judges 3, Moab creates a coalition of forces that includes Ammon. And they become the enemy of Israel. It continues in Judges 10, 7, where we read that Israelites serve the gods of, among others, the Ammonites. Just a few chapters later, Ammon is linked with the worship of Chemosh, another god that Israel will add to its growing pantheon at that time. Throughout the rest of Israel's history, they continually increases the enemies of Israel. Most notably through their ever-present idolatry. And their idolatry was some of the most horrific in its practice. 1 Kings 11 is the introduction of state-sponsored worship of other idols of the nations. Solomon builds idols to Chemosh and Molech, the gods of Moab and Ammon. This Molech worship is the same we already mentioned in Leviticus 18 and 20. It's called out throughout the Old Testament. Jeremiah and Psalm 106 uh, both speak to it multiple times. Molech Molech worship specifically was the practice of child sacrifice. Passing children through the flame. In 2 Kings 23, it's named outright. It's taking place in the Hinnom Valley right outside of Jerusalem where they would cause their sons and daughters to pass through the flame of burnt sacrifice to a false god. 
by the time we get to the conclusion of Israel and Judah's history, Ammon and Moab are, are, are promised that they're going to be punished like all the other nations. And no less than six prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and Zephaniah, that they're, they're prophesied against because they sided with Israel's enemies. They blocked the escape of those who were retreating from invaders. They rejoiced at their suffering. And Amos tells us they went so far as to rip open the pregnant women for the sake of expanding their borders. The final mention from Moab and Ammon comes from Zephaniah chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9 where it says, I've heard the taunting of Moab, the revilings of the sons of Ammon. Which they have taunt, with which they have taunted my people. And they've become arrogant <clears throat> against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom, and the sons of Ammon like Gomorrah, a place possessed by nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The remnant of my people will plunder them, and the remainder of my nation will inherit them. This is the legacy of Lot. Do you feel it now? Poor Lot. There's no way he could have known. There's no way he could have known that his decision to just get close, just, just do what would draw him a little away from God's people, a little away from God's promise of blessing, and draw a little bit in the direction of that which was, you know, it seems fine. I know that the men there are exceedingly wicked, but do you think he could have ever imagined that pitching his tent towards Sodom would ever go this way? That it would reverberate into generations that are postured towards incredible wickedness. Now please understand me, they, they <clears throat> They didn't suffer as a consequence of Lot's sin exactly. But he pointed them in a direction and they sprinted down the pathway to destruction. Sure, he wasn't on that road himself. They would bear the responsibility of their own destruction. They were to blame for their own choices. But he would bear the grief. Because it didn't have to be that way. Because he established them in a trajectory that would lead away from the people of God and towards their own destruction. Which leads us to the exode, the conclusion. It, the exode is this, this rounding out of what's heard in a tragedy. Aristotle and delineating the types of poetry or drama, he, he gives us the structure of a tragedy, which isn't necessarily sad, it's just serious. It's something that reflects the immensity, the, the, the burden of painful situations in life. And he says the conclusion, the sort of pivotal moment is called the recognition. And the best form of recognition is a reversal of the situation. It's this realization of what have I done. Scripture doesn't record Lot's recognition. It doesn't record when Lot saw what he had become or if he ever fully did. But Scripture records for us in no uncertain terms the reversal. The reversal that took place in Lot's life from being in the tents of Abram to being in a cave with his daughters. One commentator sums it up this way. Lot's cave is a bitter sequel to the house which had dwarfed his uncle's tent. The little trio is pathetic after the teeming crowd of 13.5. You, you remember why they left, right? Why they left Abram. Their household and their possessions were too great. And now it's down to the three of them. The end of choosing to carve out his career was to lose even the custody of his body. His legacy, Moab and Ammon, was destined to provide the worst carnal seduction in the history of Israel and the cruelest religious perversion, that of Molech. So much stemmed from, self, from such a self-regarding choice and persistence in it. Beloved, where will 
our self-regarding choices lead us? Where will our choices that seem fine in the moment, I'm sure I'll be able to keep myself from Sodom. I'm sure that I can sort of straddle the line. I'll hold on to this and to this. Beloved, we, as I mentioned, don't have the foresight to see. We do have the perfect record. We do have the sure word of prophecy that says, don't do what they did. We come to a section like Genesis 19, 30 through 38, and we say, man, that's crazy. I could never see my... I'm sure Lot would have said the same. We say, that's crazy. I can't relate to that. One of the things that we encourage people as they read through the scripture is, what is this text saying? What does it mean? What does it teach me about God? What does it teach me about me? And how do I respond? There can be this sort of arrogance that says, I don't see myself in this story. Beloved, do we take heed to the warnings that are here? That Lot would consider his situation in chapter 13 and say, you know, I think I'm going I'm to stick around. We understand the other writers of scripture, they give us the exit, they give us the conclusion. Sodom and Gomorrah, as we've already seen, as we walked through some time ago, Matthew 10, it becomes typological of the judgment that awaits at the end. It's repeated in Luke 16, 28 through 33. It's actually the first explicit reference to Lot, apart from Moab and Edom, since Genesis 19. And there in Luke 17, he serves as a warning figure. On the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It would be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Luke 18, 31 tells us, On that day the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. Likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. And most of us stop right there. But you know, there's another verse that we like to kind of keep in isolation away from the rest of what just happened. We know this verse, we're we're familiar with it, but here it packs so much more of a punch when we consider it in light of Lot. Remember Lot's wife, whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Beloved, do you hear the warning? Lot tried to have both. Lot's the figure of one saved as though through fire. He barely made it out. It's no accident that verse 33 comes here. You'll lose your life if you try to play Lot's game. You'll lose your life if you try to play Lot's game. Well, but you know, it worked out for Lot. Did it? What what selfishness, what arrogance that would say, well, at least I'll be okay. There's records in the Old Testament of those men. How about King Hezekiah? Well, at least there will be peace in my days. And he's granted 15 years. And when his 12-year-old son, so do the math, that means that he's born during that extension of his lifetime. When his 12-year-old son takes the throne, he becomes one of the most wicked that Judah had seen to that point. At least it's not during my lifetime. Love, these things are here to warn us. I I sometimes jokingly say a lot of times my students, they just want to kind of get down to brass tacks, right? Did Lot make it? You know, did did he get in? 2 Peter 2 is clear. Lot was regenerate. Amazingly, he's called righteous. He's counted as one who's forgiven. But he's certainly not portrayed as someone you'd want to be. 2 Peter 2 describes him as oppressed daily by the wicked. He's tormented. He's miserable. But he chose it. Beloved, it doesn't have to be that way. No one wants to be Lot. But we think we can. We think we can live like Lot, but wind up with a different outcome. You, you know, and we say this often, all sin is believing a lie. All sin is believing some kind of falsehood. That what God has said is not as good as what sin's promising right now. 
All sin is believing a lie that what God has said not will deliver more than what God says I should. And how about this one, that we can live with both, that we can live close to Sodom and not smell like the smoke of its destruction. One of the points of Moses recording this for Israel was also to warn them to accomplish what one commentator said, the point would have been clear to Israel, and it should be clear today. No good can come of loving a society so morally bankrupt that, a, that it awaits the swift judgment of God. Beloved, Scripture is clear. You cannot love the world and expect to be okay. First John tells us that we can't love the world and love the Father. Which is why there's so many question marks around Lot. As I've prepared for this and sort of rehearsed this to my wife, continually she's coming to me and she's saying, I just don't see it. How can he be a believer with what things like 1 John tells us? With what we clearly know? Maybe Lot didn't love the world to the point of being an unbeliever, but dizzyingly he loved living just close enough that he smelt like the smoke that destroyed it and his family. How about this? Do you believe that Lot lived with assurance? Do you believe that he lived with the joy that comes with a clean conscience? The assurance that you are accepted in the beloved. Assurance is a wonderful gift. Beloved, it is something that we may have. Second Peter actually begins in chapter 1 saying you should make your calling and your election sure by examining if these things be yours and are increasing. Because if they do, they render you fruitful. But Peter goes on to write about Lot and says he was tormented. Do you really want to live the Lot life? Living just so close to the edge that you might make it Miserable though you are, you'll make it. And cast your children into hell by your love of this world. But you'll make it. Dale Ralph Davis quotes A.W. Tozer when he says, like Demas, if we asked, did he get in, most often we'd have to end up being able to say is, well, the last time I saw them, they were walking in the wrong direction. The final word on Demas is he's loved this world. But well, did he ever repent? We don't know. The last time I saw him, he was walking in the wrong direction. Imagine for Lot, we, we never read about a reconciliation. We never read that he and Abram got back together and Abram had some consolation. He, he knew that morning when he saw the smoke rising like that from a furnace. He knew that there weren't even ten righteous. And I wonder it, how his heart ached and he thought, what about Lot? Because last time I saw him, he was walking in the wrong direction. So beloved, what do we do with this? I've said already, I'm, I'm terrified of how many Lots might be here tonight. Or how many we might know. I think especially of the men, the husbands, the fathers. Men, don't be Lot. Don't live so close to the world that you might escape the flames that devour it, but your wife and children won't. Don't live so close to Sodom. Flee. Imagine if Lot had run to the hills and caves long before. Imagine if as he realized, no, you're right, the men of Sodom are exceedingly wicked. I ain't hanging out here. Imagine if he had told Abram decades before, no thanks, Uncle Abe. I'll call the herd, but I'm sticking with you. How different a trajectory. But it doesn't have to be this way. For all who hear this this evening, what are we doing near Sodom? We love to quote 1 Corinthians, well, we can't get out of the world. We live in it, but we're not of it. 
as if that's some sort of license to act as if there's no distinction. Beloved, do we hate the garment spotted with the flesh? Do we long not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed upon? Like Philippians chapter 3, do we look eagerly for the transformation that awaits us? We saw the long-term trajectory that Lot's family followed. <clears throat> but even that, it doesn't have to be this way. Maybe you've already raised your family in Sodom. Maybe you yourself have been brought up there. One pastor paints a vivid picture as he preached from this text, and he encouraged those listening to him to imagine if someone from Sodom came into the service tonight. He remarks, you'd probably pull your kids just a little bit closer, but imagine as one got up and read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. And beloved, if that's you, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay. Think of the excuses that Lot must have afforded. It was hours that the angels compelled him to leave. Were they packing? Were they saying, well, but we've got this lovely house here. We, we, we're used to living in tents and we finally have upgraded. Beloved, it, it doesn't have to stay this way. It will cost, but not nearly as much as it will cost to stay. But we don't have to continue in these things. And the trajectory maybe set by those before us or maybe that we had set for others. It doesn't have to stay this way. I've taken some time to share the legacy of Lot and Ammon and Moab, but maybe, maybe you remember a certain daughter of Moab. She married a man named Malon. He died shortly thereafter. This daughter of Moab would relocate back to her husband's homeland with her mother-in-law and would remarry a man named Boaz. And her story is recorded in the book that bears her name. And as she's referred to it in it as Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth was a descendant of the deeds of Genesis 19, 30 through 38. She was in the line of incest from an idolatrous people that sacrificed their children in the fire. But Matthew 1, 5 doesn't hesitate to name her explicitly as the great-grandmother of David the king, whose distant son was the king of kings, Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved, there's a warning, but there's grace. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to remain in Moab. We don't have to pitch our tent towards Sodom and be tormented. We don't have to live the tragedy of Lot. This is specifically geared up to this point. It's geared towards those who know the truth and yet are struggling with, do we stay? Do we hold on just a little bit longer? Do we, do we try to have both somehow and remain in torment? But we also have to recognize the fact that there are those that we know who will be swept away in the judgment. And beloved, our testimony, our witness... How did Lot get here? Well, his sons-in-law, they wouldn't come because they didn't take him seriously because he had lived in Sodom too long. Beloved, what does our witness say to others? As we profess, look, this world isn't it, are we living like it is? Is our witness undermined by our residence? By our lifestyle, by our commitment to, you know, live like 
the rest of those in Sodom because, you know, the grass is really green there. But we don't have to live the tragedy of Lot. While we hear, while we listen, there remains an opportunity. There's a tremendous warning and amazing grace in these eight verses. Will we heed it? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are so gracious to provide this warning for us. You're so good that you record the, the downfall of this family. The destructive weight of the choices that one man trying to love you and love the world wrought. You've been good and gracious to preserve them. And Lord, to preserve the, the, the hope of grace in your servant Ruth. Father, I ask that you would extend grace this evening, that we would heed this warning. We would forsake all those things that would tie us, that we would readily lose our life for your sake. That we would hate this world with our love for you. We ask this in Christ's name.